word here. Okay. So could you just um, count the well, three or four? I can check your mic. One, two, three, That's good. four. So before you volunteered to go to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, what were you doing? What was your life at that, at that time? I was in high school. Um, so when I joined up, uh, I was in Thunder Bay, I was in Ontario, and what they had actually just instituted um, with post, or sorry, um, uh, not post-secondary, but uh, high school uh, credits is they had the co-op uh, co course. So what you do is you go out into the community and you do a specific job, and then you get credits for school to help you graduate. But at that time, uh, the reserves had actually uh, talked to the, the Lakehead Board of Education and said, hey, can we do something with the military, with the reservists, so these kids can come do their, uh, at that time it was QL2, uh, oh, yeah, no, QL2, uh, go do your, uh, your, Q, or your basic training and get some credits, get paid, and get in the military. And that's pretty much my introduction to it. But prior to that, I was just a kid. I was an 18-year-old kid, fit, running, wrestling, didn't really think too much of uh, a career or what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. And a friend of mine literally said, hey, you want to join up and make some money? And that's what we did. Not, that's that's honestly that's that's what it was prior. Uh, most of my adult life ended up going, or sorry, ended up uh, um, being dedicated to the reserves in Thunder Bay. So, how much time, uh, how much experience in the reserves did you have before you volunteered to go overseas? I had at that time. Uh, by the time we actually uh, went to Shiloh and started workup training, I had about nine years in the reserves, and. Um, uh, what happened was is early in my career, uh, you know, there is the expression of a mobum, but I was a full time, I was working full time as a reservist on Class B's. Um, I had got my uh, first Class B going back and forth to the uh, uh, medical school down Borden and teaching there, and then I kind of got uh, a taste of leadership structure and just kind of teaching. So I wanted to kind of carry on with that and also pay the bills, so I actually got a job recruiting uh, in Thunder Bay, did that for approximately two years, and from that experience, I basically moved from Thunder Bay to Edmonton as the um, uh, TCCC, so the Tactical Casualty Combat Care uh, Coordinator for 1CMBG to do everybody that had to go out the door for Afghanistan. We were running courses, or I was coordinating with uh, the units here in Edmonton to make that happen. So that's really... Uh, in a nutshell, that's that's really kind of my reserve experience prior to going to Afghanistan. Um, okay, so let's talk about that. When, why did you decide to to volunteer to go to Afghanistan? Pride initially. Uh, that's what was going on in the, in the world at that time, and that's what we were really focused on. Um, in the Canadian Forces. That was a big deal. That was pretty much going to be my opportunity uh, to go abroad and, and do my job that, uh, that I enjoy doing. And I really enjoy being in the military and being a member of the CF, or sorry, I guess CAF at this point. Um, but that's, that's what it was initially, pride. I'm going to go there, I'm going to do my job, and I'm, I'm going to get some experience and try and bring that back to the reserves and bring that back to my unit. And, and just, again, get what I can out of it. That's initially what it was. Would your uh, Would your family and friends say when you told them of your plan? Very supportive, actually, very supportive. Um, funny story it was a bit of a paradigm shift with my mother. So to go back a little bit, when I was looking to join the reserves, she was very against it. She's like, "I'm not waving goodbye to my son on the tarmac, saying, you know, see you later, and you're going to deploy him wherever, or sorry, wherever you." Um, I won't be as colorful as she was with her language, but wherever you're going to take him, I don't want him to, to go there. Uh, everybody basically said, it's like, that's not going to happen within the reserves. But during that time frame, and when I got up to the opportunity to go, it had done a complete 180. She was very supportive of it. She's like, yep, do it. Go have that, go, go have that adventure. Uh, go get that experience. Do what you want to do. Very supportive of it. Uh, my wife, who is also uh, in the reserves as well, too, as a nursing officer, at the time, oh sorry, no, she was a uh, warrant officer at the time, very supportive of it as well, and said, yeah, if this is what you want to do, then then let's make this happen, and common law at that time. What did you do for uh, your workout training to get ready? We, it gets a little fuzzy just with the dates, but we, <laughs> the plan was to stay in Edmonton and hopefully do up all my, all my workup training there. 
uh, but because we were going to be attached to the uh, PRT, and at that time uh, the PRT rotation had gone to two VP, and then through I can't remember if it was one or three VP at that time because it was 309 had actually taken on the battle group uh, tasking. No, no, it was one had taken on battle group and three was on the omelet, I believe, on that rotation, but I could be I could be incorrect. But because two VP was the PR2 at that time, we uh, had to go to Shiloh for the entire workup training. That was a bit of a surprise, uh, a little angry with that initially, but uh, again, this is what you want. These, this is what you will do um, to prepare and do this ta and sorry do this deployment that I wanted to do. So um, had a little tough or so that was a little uh, that was a little tough initially just because I was so far away from uh, uh, at that point my immediate family who was my common law uh, uh, Vanessa there and that was tough. But again, we had a good group that we were working with, a fantastic group of med tech or sorry uh, of med techs, docs, PAs, and two VP as far as I'm concerned were amazing. They were they were excellent. Uh, they understood where I was coming from. Uh, they saw that I wasn't. Uh, they saw that I was basically able to perform my job and do do what I was supposed to do. So, with that, um, you know, there was a very strong, or sorry, there was a very good relationship with um, uh, the medical, the sorry, the med techs and the UMS on the ground, and the actual um, um, two VP that we'd be working with. So that was that was ha that was good, and that made things a lot easier. What about the the reserve mix. How was that relationship? Um, it is what it is, right? Like you, you have to know what you're coming into. And to give a little bit of background, uh, I was a sergeant um, uh, prior to actually signing the paperwork. Um, but they were like, "No, you're going as a master corporal. That's that." And I was like, "Yeah, sure. That's that's fine. If that's what I need to do, I'm more than happy to uh, to do that. Like this will this will be my opportunity. So as long as you just kind of accept your lot in life, and then from there." It's it's a bit of, it's a case of proving ground all the time, and that's fine. Just like any any job and any profession that you move into, there's that transition phase where it's like, what's this guy all about, or how well is he going to perform? And then when expectations are met, and a lot of cases exceeded, um, respect and trust and camaraderie is built from there. So it was good, uh, rough. So to answer your question, though, sir, a little tough, but then thing as as everybody worked together. And that camaraderie and that trust and respect was was built. Things got very things things were were, were good. Things were very good. Don't we, don't uh, there's no need to call me sir. Okay, gotcha. Just, uh, yeah, just keep it light. Keep it light. Keep it, well, keep it yeah, keep it light. Keep it vague. Okay. Um, but what kinds of things were you doing uh, for your workout training? Where was the emphasis? Uh, and a lot of it uh, again was uh, basic soldier skills. Got to go. Um, make sure that all the IBTS training is complete. People are comfortable with the weapons. People, people are comfortable with, um, uh, again, a lot of the first aid skills. And you know what? Fitness was a big thing. You know, there was a lot of marching. And uh, the uh, commander of the PRT at the time had stated that a number, like had reinforced that a number of times. You know, make sure you're, make sure you're ready to do this. This isn't going to be easy. And, you know, made, made the training uh, appropriate and, and uh, challenging. We'll just leave it at that. But that was good. That was a good thing. So a lot of that was, an, uh, that was the initial focus. And also getting people uh, familiar with all the equipment. So for me, I had to go do my crew commander course. Um, people were getting uh, familiar with all the, uh, all the vehicles that were getting, sorry, that were going. A lot of 50 cal training for the uh, reservists. And uh, yeah, just a lot of ranges, a lot of ranges, a lot of shooting, a lot of carrying your ruck around and, and just, again, those basic soldier skills that were just so key to be reinforced initially. That was the big thing. What were you focusing on uh, on the medical side? Uh, with us, um, <laughs> equipment, making sure that we actually had uh, what we needed for um, uh, the workup training and uh, I, I can't remember which or how high the, the ranges actually went up to in Suffield, but um, uh, I think it was level six. Again, just to keep it, just uh, again, I, I can't remember if it was level five or level six that we're working up to, but uh, the big comprehensive exercise for, uh, for workup, that was kind of our main focus to make sure we had uh, modular tent, um, we had uh, stretches, but I remember uh, stretcher straps were a big thing because there'd be a lot of med uh, medevac um, with the training. Um, 
and just making sure that we were able to support people if all of a sudden we had no duff situations. And uh, that was really the big, like a lot of the workup training medically for us. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, Commander Briggs, um, who was in charge of the medical component uh, for us deploying, uh, advocated for everybody to have the uh, TAC Med course, so the tactical medicine course that they uh, had designed for uh, the med tech and basically everybody that was going to be deployed for Afghanistan. Uh, that was the big thing that everybody needed prior to deploying to Shiloh, and that was by far some of the best training I've ever had. And bar, bar none, uh, if, uh, if you're a medical professional in any sense, especially within the pre-hospital or, or the emergency side, th you need that training. That is, that is probably some of the best training you'll ever receive. And uh, uh, C. Toms, they were the guys that actually ran it. And I don't, again, I'm not trying to advertise anything, but um, those guys uh, saved lives. Um, they advocated good medicine. Um, they advocated um, high, fidelity, or sorry, high fidel fidelity uh, scenarios. And completely, completely submersive and 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 uh, and real time, uh, real time um, trauma, and it was good. It was excellent. So, for for me, we were very well prepared medically um, prior to uh, the exercise in, in uh, Suffield. There, you mentioned trauma. Yes, uh, and that's what we expect. That, mm -hmm. that kind of medicine from uh, a combat zone. Mm -hmm. What? How? Um, uh, how realistic was the was the trauma training that you received at the time? For the means of this interview, I can't really go into a lot of specifics of actually uh, what we used for um, for models and what we used for the trauma scenarios, but it was as realistic as it can get. The, tra the what the what they had in place was as realistic, if not in some cases more more or sorry, it it, it was real time. Um, real-time trauma that you were that you were dealing with and it was as realistic as they could make it and in a lot of cases I still draw on that training with my current with my current uh, job right now because it was that realistic mm -hmm. uh, I, I know kind of what you're referring to but what, what what's the concern here in terms of describing what the treatment was um, it was more so how we 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 went up we went about getting um, this. Uh, you know what? I'll just I'll just say it, and then we'll kind of go from there. But that we use models. So and what the models were were um, ah, whatever they were pigs. We we used pigs, um, and uh, they were sedated. They were treated humanely. Uh, everything was incredibly documented. Uh, veterinarians were there. Uh, doctors were there and these these were and the respect that we had for what um, this 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 model was doing for us and allowing us to do and again like you know there's a lot of humane or sorry humanitarian issues that are involved in this there's a lot of different views on on what we're doing to to uh, this model which is you know a, a, a living breathing creature but the experience we got out of it um, uh, you know, working with working with these people and the trauma they were able to inflict, and seeing and understanding how the body would react, and in a lot of cases, understanding how much we could withstand, tr like with within the trauma we would be exposed to, just gave everybody uh, confidence, gave them a better appreciation of the knowledge that we that we knew, and really enforced the basics. If you could stop the bleeding, make sure that the heart's still beating. Get a helicopter or get whatever you have for uh, evacuation means to to get this person from uh, or off the X to a, a world uh, like a world class one uh, five star the, probably the best surgical suite on the planet and with some of the most experienced tra trauma doctors nurses uh, even med techs like uh, if you could get them there within that five to ten minute time frame these people would live. You had like a 90, at the end of it, I think it was anywhere from a 90, 98 percentile of survival, um, getting them from the initial incident to that trauma theater. And that's amazing. That was amazing. And this course and what we were put through reinforced that and just gave us, gave us that confidence. You were ready. You were prepared. I felt, you know, and, and again, um, experiences vary, but I was prepared. I was confident. 
and I was ready to do the job I was. And again, we were the crew commanders, and in a lot of cases, uh, depending on some tours and how, um, and again, we had a lot of uh, um, uh, people that had gone and employed and done the job that I had done come back and say, you know, things would be so bad that you would have to help um, or you'd have to try, try and triage or treat um, in certain situations. So they just reinforce like there's a very good chance of using these skills and this is why it's so important that everybody has this opportunity to take it. Um, but again, just to get to my point, like you, you were prepared after that course. Like it was an excellent course. Not as well, uh, doesn't, it's not really, again, it's not advertised what we, what we did on that course and I, I don't know how much trouble I'm gonna get in for saying that, but uh, at the same time, like it's completely necessary. And, uh, w if you want to look at it as, as a necessary evil, and maybe that might be the wrong term to use, but it's the first one that kind of comes to mind. But uh, it, it, it gave everybody the confidence and knowledge, and, um, and they were just prepared for uh, what we would be facing. And again, understanding how to evacuate these people from that initial incident and get them to that, that treatment they need. Sorry, I went on a little long there. No, that's not a problem. I just don't, I want to verify just one number you said. You, you used a figure five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Five to ten minutes for what? Uh, so in a lot of uh, what what you'd see, and again, different different tours actually had different uh, uh, evacuation time frames. But with us, um, there was there were some incidences that actually occurred, and uh, as soon as you had um, the uh, the injured member or uh, someone had had been exposed to either an IED or explosion or whatnot, um, if you can get up that nine liner, get that information communicated back up get that helicopter in the air like we were getting like helicopters were landing within a five to ten minute time frame and then from that five to ten minute time frame so from initial contact anywhere from five six minutes might have passed get them on the helicopter in that time frame so roughly anywhere from like 15 to 20 minutes you get these people to a rural one facility which is unheard of unheard of even even western medicine even medicine right now the, the medicine I practice I can't do that I can't it's not possible. And again, my, my, my numbers might be a little skewed, but you would still have people in surgical suites in incredibly remote, dangerous areas within like a 20, 20 minute, half an hour time frame. And they're going under the knife and they're, and they're, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, these thoracic surgeons uh, or uh, um, orthopedic surgeons, all, all these, this, this, you know, this dynamic team would come together and save these guys. You know, for better or worse, and again, there's a there's a whole different outlook on how um, these guys, or sorry, or sorry, some of our members have uh, been injured and then they come back, and you know, you know, there's a lot of rehabilitation and there's a lot of uh, you know physical injury that they have to work through. And again, I'm only I'm, I'm only speak I'm not speaking to anyone that I know personally or, or just a lot of the uh, the issues that some people have worked through. But uh, again, like I can't provide that here in Edmonton. I can't. But we were able to do something amazing. Well, again, I would say amazing uh, when we were deployed. That's what we were able to do. Um, I was very fortunate that uh, it only happened a couple times, and nothing of, and with my experience, nothing of any uh, uh, severe gravity. But there were other people that weren't as fortunate as me. Some people had some bad incidences, but again, we, a lot of the people were prepared for that, medically and. Uh, and uh, uh, and first responders as well too. I'm just going to pause for a second. Certainly. Um, for a civilian audience, mm -hmm. can you just take a second to explain the difference between a rule one and a rule three facility? C certainly. Um, so rule one, rule three, and uh, I have used some terms like UMS, and I think it's it's changed again as well too. Um, but rule one, rule two is what we were using in Afghanistan. Uh, the reason that they'd actually be called a rule one or rule two versus um, you know a UMS or whatnot is the rule one, rule two allowed a little bit of flexibility for manning. So you could have a rule one plus or minus uh, depending on who would actually be at that facility. Uh, and a lot of it was the physician assistant was the big thing that you'd need so that you'd have somebody uh, that could run uh, either a cardiac arrest, do more invasive treatments, uh, prescribe antibiotics, and ensure that um, the stability of the people that are there. So if they're, um, 
again, if it's a trauma issue and severely, and severely injured, they're going to be uh, removed from that rule one to a rule three, and I'll get into the explanation of that. But if all of a sudden people are having either, um, you know, back pain, knee pain, or, you know, in a lot of cases have a terrible infection, uh, a lot of GI over there, uh, which is never fun for anyone. But if all of a sudden they're no longer able to monitor these people or they're, uh, in a lot of cases, outweighing the resources at that Rule 1 facility, you have somebody with that medical expertise, so the PA physician, uh, senior med techs, that'll say, you know what, we need to evacuate you or you need to you need to go to some place where we can monitor you. So from your Rule 1 to your Rule, and again, there's Rule 2 and Rule 3, but with Rule 3 facility, um, you might have everything from OR suites to uh, holding facilities, um, and you'll have just basically more medical expertise at those areas to deal with either more complex trauma, uh, maybe Maybe in some cases like people that are ill or sick or um, just need to be monitored as well and in, and in some cases I'm not sure how much mental health had actually been there but I know with my tour there were uh, we tried to have as much mental health and support that we could uh, um, in in theater so after all this work of training mm -hmm. uh, what's your expectation about what you're going into remember how you felt at the time you know I felt excited. Like that's I'll be completely honest. I felt I felt excited. It was it was something new. I felt prepared for it. And then I just remember when I got there, I was completely overwhelmed. I was I I was I couldn't understand I couldn't fathom the heat. I'll never forget the heat, and I'm pretty sure that's something that's always brought up. Uh, I couldn't get over the size, like how big everything was. I was like, wow, this is this is the show, this is where we're at. And then, um, but we were there and we were there with, again, some of the senior leadership where we initially uh, uh, came in and, and uh, did, the, did the rip because we were doing it with, um, uh, I can't remember which, I'm not sure, I th I mean, it was pretty, I'm pretty sure it was the Van Dues that, that were there. I can't remember which, which organization or which company was there. But uh, I just remember being excited, excited, scared, um, overwhelmed all in one it's just almost felt like after that initial kind of shock wore off, wore off that I was there and I was excitement and I was or the excitement it just kind of turned into this this almost blank slate where you reverted back just to your training it's like okay I need to get my truck let's find the truck I need oh sorry it wasn't even that it was okay I need to find my kit let's get the kit let's find out where my where uh, where the actual uh, role one is or where the uh, where the where uh, the medics actually are let's figure out where that is Let's go to Canada House. Let's try and figure out where that is. And just, again, it was just get your gear. Make sure you have that first and foremost. Make sure you got your rifle. Get some get some mags, get some bullets, and let's kind of go from there, right? So, again, back to that individual soldier training, right? Have your kit. Make sure you're good. From there, figure out the, pe the people that you're going to be working with. Keep them close because this is the group you're going to be with. And then try and find your leadership uh, on ground and then figure out when and how you're going to be getting out to the PRT. And then a lot of the, and then afterwards it was basically sit on your kit and wait. Cause I think, uh, I think they were doing, you're there for at least three days in CAF at the time and you're getting all the briefings and I'll still never remember. I'll still never forget the RCMP briefing cause they were there and they just talked about, um, grow ops. And like, if all of a sudden you find like an X amount of, um, of uh, opium, like what to do and I just like we all I just remember we all just kind of sat and looked at each other we're like is this is this really happening and yeah it, it was so for me it was just everything kind of came together and uh and I'll just I'll never remember like I don't know if I'll ever have that same kind of feeling again because it was just so new and you just had to kind of work through it so that that's kind of how it worked for me that's your expectations for to the environment and stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what, what were your hopes for yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, what did you hope to get out of this at the end of this six or seven month tour? Mm. You know, you can always go back to, do you want experience, maybe some cash, a medal? I'll be honest, I didn't really expect I was going to come back. Like that, That's what... I prepared for that. I'll be completely honest. I, I've had a few uh, discussions afterwards with people and that's what it was like, you know what? I think I'm not sure if I'll be coming back. Like that, that's kind of what it was. It was just, 
at that time and just kind of my expectation, it was, it was, let's just get through every single day. Let's do every single day. Let's set up a routine and, um, and, and just try to work through every single day, every single problem and not really forecast out that far. That's, I'll be completely honest. That's what it was. That, that was kind of my expectation. Do everything I can live every minute, live every hour, just live in the present. And if I get back, I'll kind of work out the, I'll work at it or I'll, I'll make a new plan from there. But that's to be completely honest. That's what it was. Not that, and again, like it was a winter tour and you know, the thing is that there's so much, there's so much hype. Like there was just so much hype. It's like, you know, there is, you're, you're going to get shot at. There's going to be explosions. There's going to be this, there's going to be that. And, there, and don't get me wrong. There were, there were people that had those tours. Um, and, and, and that's what people were preparing you for. And it was like, if you die, who gets your stuff? I'll never forget that. That was from the, uh, the lawyer. He's just like, I just want everyone to know, like, if, if there's a possibility you're not coming back and if you die, make sure everybody, or sorry, the people that you love are going to get your stuff. Cause then they went through all the horror stories of people that had passed away. And then all of a sudden some ex gets all their money and their current wife doesn't get anything. So, you know, that was what you were thinking. It's like, all right, well, let's just focus on the here and now. And I, I'm guessing, to really answer your question, I'm hoping the expectation is that I make it through this and I got all of my limbs and I'm going to go back home, to be honest. Tell me about uh, the first time you, uh, you go outside the wire to, as in your capacity with the, with the bison animal. Um, we got in. I remember, I remember it actually quite well. Uh, we got in, got our gear. We're... Uh, getting kind of orientated to the PRT. Everyone was good. Uh, they kind of showed us what and who and where everybody's at. And then uh, the QRF rolled in. Um, we got the Bisonam there. It was a little bit of like uh, that broken English because like, again, my French is okay. His English is all right. So it was like, le gun, le bison. It's like, le stuff. I was like, okay, sure. So he's like, the list. So we go through the list and Check it all off, everything looks okay. Got my comms, make sure my comms are up and running. Uh, make sure that uh, crypto is all in, life's good. Uh, I learned from uh, the, Berge the, the big, or sorry, the, um, uh, the collective training in, in Suffield, how to actually make sure that the, the radio is connected to the antenna so I can talk to people, made sure that that was going on and we were pretty much ready to ready to go that was that was it it was very fast the nice thing is the entire crew changed out at the same time the issue was is because we were going to be embedded with the um, uh, QRF for the PRT the entire time and we were with the counter uh, or the CIED guys uh, they hadn't come in yet and so we were still with the French guys and we were still with the Van Dues with the QRF so we got the lay of the land and said as soon as this radio barks and says uh, um, I think you basically came, you know, it's funny. I had it for seven months and I can't even remember what the call sign was anymore, like seven months, but I, I still have issues with the radio breaking every single time. But they'd say, as soon as you get the, the call for one, two, three, and four, you're heading down, you're going to get your orders and you're going to go. So we were just kind of waiting for that. Got the, fir got the call maybe that evening, like around five, six, cause we just finished up supper, but we got the call. Went down, hopped in the truck, out the door we went. And uh, the guys, like the Van Dues even said, it's like, yeah, we took a lot of bombs apart, but it was pretty uneventful, like nothing really happened. So uh, we went out. Uh, I, I remember it. We came down. Um, it was right by uh, Alexander the Great's castle there. I can never, I always forget the road, but we did pass by the prison. Went out, took a, took a right, came down the road. Uh, and all of a sudden, everybody kind of set up the cordon. They're going to go check out the IED. Life's good. And we got shot at. All of a sudden, actively engaged by the enemy. And I'll tell you, that was interesting. That was completely interesting. I'm like, well, here we go. Uh, I'll still never forget my driver. He's out of his hatch. He's got his weapon. Because he was, he was, this is what he was there for, the show. And he just looks at me, and he's like, fire at that tree line. Let's go. So... Hit the Coppola, turned the C6, started shooting, and the goddamn gun jammed. Cleared it, and he's just like, just relax, man. Clear the gun, shoot again. Cleared it, got a couple more rounds, jammed. I was like, fuck's sake. 
sorry, I don't mean to, don't mean to swear. Um, did it again, jam, but, but at this time, everyone, the, uh, the Van Dudes figured out, it was like, oh man, we're getting engaged. So they were pulling around and just setting up their cordon and then just trying to figure out who was shooting at us and what happened. And it was a couple bursts. And the problem is like, it's just, it's so long ago now that you, you kind of remember big, you kind of remember certain things. I just remember, uh, I, I would argue that there was rounds landing just because I saw the dust kind of kick up by the bison. And I'll never forget this aim, uh, this police guy. There he, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm a very visual kinetic kind of guy. And there he was, and he's got his RPG. I don't know what it was, but it looked like from the Soviets. It was this old, old uh, uh, RPG. And he just fires it. He fires it over the tree line. I don't know what he, because like, I don't know what he's firing at. But these guys are like, yeah, fire, boom. And they're just ex shooting stuff, exploding. Uh, Kiowa came in. It started shooting at the tree line. I don't know what they were even shooting at at that point. And I was just kind of like, well, my damn gun jammed. This sucks. Took a, took a couple more hours for us to finish. And I, again, I don't want to, there were some other kind of humorous things that happened at that point, but I don't want anything to kind of come out at anyone else's expense, but it was just like, huh, okay, well, this is what's happening. This is, this is how it's going to be. That's what I figured. I figured this is going to be the tempo the entire time. So right on. Yeah. We go back. My driver starts yelling at me because it's dark and I'm trying to back him in. And, uh, he's yelling at me because he's like, he was stating that the man dudes were probably laughing at us because we look kind of messed up backing things in. It was the first time. So we got it all squared away. And I just remember coming in and, uh, uh, the captain, he was uh, two VP, came up and he's just like, first time you got shot at, eh? I'm like, yep. He's like, well, got your cherry pop. Good for you. And then we just went and had something to drink, had something to eat. And you were kind of like, wow, this is how it's going to be. Uh, first thing I did was went and cleaned the gun. It's full, full of clean swabs. The gas regulator, I'll never forget. That it was just caked. So again, lessons learned. But that, that, was, that was the first time. That was awesome. And then from there, it was a lot of sitting and waiting and taking bombs apart but still you know you're doing something right you're taking bombs apart but there was never never anything like that again was there um could you describe like a, a typical day or you, know, you, you mentioned you want to get into your routine mm -hmm. what what was your routine you know what we actually it was it was pretty good because we were 15 minutes notice to move for the entire seven seven months um but it was basically have your radio on you radio squawks get get back to uh, the CP real quick, or sorry, get back to the, uh, no, I can't remember if we had a talk in there, if we had a CP, I don't remember, but just get back there, get orders, and they were basically, you are here, go here, take the bomb apart, and then come back, so that was pretty much the quick frago we'd get, and then we'd go, but wake up, uh, wake up, breakfast, that was always the big thing, you know, shower, or uh, if you could, um, head over to the UMS and help out with them. If all of a sudden sick parade got real busy, we come in, give them a hand. Uh, they were, again, we were very fortunate that uh, uh, the doctor that was there and uh, the team that we had uh, respected what I knew and my knowledge. So again, it was a lot of physical assessment and whatever you needed. You just talk to the doc and it's like, ah, ibuprofen. Uh, you know, give some people uh, some naproxen if they needed a little quick. Well, I don't think we had much for antibiotics. It was a lot of like just you know, clean things and make sure nothing's going to get infected. Um, but yeah, it was just kind of the, the routine there. If things got busy, if we got called out, then we took off. Um, and that was fine. We just said, hey, we got to go out the door you went. Uh, I always did a morning workout and I did an afternoon run and then basically breakfast, lunch, dinner. But it was, that was pretty much about it. Um, I didn't do much for, well, I didn't do a whole lot for movies, like not a ton, like a lot of guys were catching up on like uh, like on some TV shows, like on downtime, or they did their video games. But I just usually try to stay pretty active. So work out in the morning and around the afternoon, and then uh, you know a little bit of a cool down, and then head over to the UMS to try and talk with the doc or maybe crack a book. A lot of emails, you know, trying emails the best that we can or stay on top of things. We had TACnet set up in there as well too. So you know you just kind of keep your ear on the ground. Uh, but then I never had any issues sleeping. And then with us, they really try not to deploy us in the evening just because with the um, uh, the EOD guys, they didn't want to operate at night. There wasn't enough light. So we did okay for sleep, but there were some early mornings and there were some late days, like late days. I think our longest might have been maybe 16, 18 hours to get the bond, get everything taken apart. But that was the routine. That's what it was. It was good. 
Yeah. What's it like being on call, a 15 minutes notice to move for for six months? Did that, was that a stressor or is that you just took it in your stride? I'm pretty user friendly. So initially at the time, you, like what I said, when when you're just operating kind of like within that next next step, next step, next step, it's just you kind of, that's what you do. That's, that's, that's how you operate. I found afterwards I had some problems. Like I had, I had some real issues where, and I, I, I still do a little bit, where you're just kind of working within the here and now and not projecting out. And I've, I've talked to people and discussed that, but I felt there was a little bit of, longer term like long term issues but the short term 27 year old guy fit working out twice you can you can tolerate that that's easy this is what i'm here to do right and again that kind of alpha male uh macho horse i'm sorry i shouldn't swear um bs kind of kicks in so you just you just roll with it so yep yeah, this is what i'm doing i think at the end it was the uh, the um uh, COO of, v, of the VP unit came up and he's like, you were on like for the whole time? I'm like, oh yeah, the whole time. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, that's what I did. He's like, oh, that, good for you. I was like, all right. That, that was it. Like, it, it's just, you're a soldier. You just do what you do. This is what you're tasked to do. Go do it. And that's, again, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty user friendly. That's, that's what I trained for and that's what I did. And I'll tell you, I, I enjoyed it. And for, for what it's worth, I'd do it again. That was a great uh, story about your first first time out. Is mm -hmm. there a, another day, another incident that stands out in your mind? Happy, sad, good, bad? That you could tell me about. You know, I, I have I have two, and they're two very different ones. Um, one, we were going out, and uh, I'm not sure if we're going out in the Dan district, but we were going pretty. Um, pretty far southeast, and we were going kind of the outskirts of, uh, of our AO, uh, just to cover over because the EOD guys couldn't get out. The guys that were actually covering that area couldn't go, so they sent us out just to deal with it. And uh, again, two VP guys were doing force protection, awesome guys, great guys. And I'll just never forget it, because we're walking up and the AMP are like, yep, bomb's over there. And you know, they get out, we're doing our vulnerable uh, uh, point search and it's just it just seems weird like there's guys on top of a building watching us like far away and there's this disturbed earth that we're about to drive over like I'm trying I'm trying to remember because I, I just I remember that the the I think one of the, the one of the front vehicles had moved around and then we were there and again, it's just how you remember it. But again, memory does play a little bit of tricks on you. But I just I, the one thing I do remember was uh, they're doing the VP and they're like, okay, yeah, I know the bombs over there, but like, what about what about this? Like this, this seems concerning. And they were like, no, no, nothing. Don't even worry about it. No, that's nothing. I was there, there like there a while ago, and it just didn't seem right. It's like, well, I how can we check this? And they're like, no, no, don't check it. It's like, no, we. I think we should check this. And then, yeah, it was just, it was kind of, it was comical. Cause it was like, no, no, nothing. No, there's nothing there. No, nothing. It's bombs over there. So anyway, we checked it and there's a bomb. Um, and there's a bomb and the guy's up in the, in the, like in the distance on top of the, the house. Like you can kind of see him get up there like, okay, all right. You know, and they just kind of try to wander off. So we get the bomb. We call the, uh, cause this was uh, the same time frame where uh, President Obama basically said, we're sending troops to Afghanistan. And it was funny because I walked in the tent. He's like, we're sending, Af we're sending troops to Afghanistan. I walked out and all the troops are literally there because I saw it on the news, which, again, amazing to see. So we called in um, the MP battalion uh, to come in and actually in investigate maybe and actually uh, detain these guys. They showed up. There was no messing around. They grabbed these people. They detained them. They were like, "You are coming with us. We're gonna investigate. Like, we're gonna we're gonna figure this all out." Got the command wire, and I, th I think we ended up taking out a cell as well too, or like some medium level guys. But that was an interesting day, and it was just like we all kind of sat and looked at each other. And I was talking with my driver, and I'm like, "You know, if they would have hit us, that would have been bad because like we were in the buys, and that was basically you're done. Like the the we had both our hatches open." We were driving around and it's like if you get hit in that thing it's over like you are finito my best option would be being and as morbid as this sounds but this is what the mindset that you're in this is what you need to do to prepare yourself i'd have been launched like in the air and might have had a better chance of survival of surviving if i would have landed like in a ditch somewhere versus being 
inside this coffin for lack of a better a better term so we talked about it. it's like that's that's messed up that was that was interesting whether or not they would have hit us who knows they again i'm i'm not the one pulling the trigger on the on the ied we were just fortunate enough that we had excellent excellent guys we were with that were diligent and said we should probably check this out so that was one and then the other i do apologize i'm getting two but the second one was uh uh, we had a fantastic doctor, I will say his name, is Dr. Uh, Jamie Thibodeau, who's no longer with us, um, uh, passed away of other complications, nothing, to, not, nothing with the tour. Um, we had this girl that was burnt, uh, maybe two-year-old girl, pr roughly, I'd even say maybe a little younger. Um, kids there would get burned quite a bit with pots of water, like they'd grab them or they'd get these real bad scalding injuries and then they were... They're not, they're not going to make it. They don't have the ability at the hospital there in, uh, in Kabul to really take care of these kids and, and you know, do complex wound dressings, uh, antibiotics, and just monitor them. So she was coming in, I think every two or three days or three days. We'd come in, change the dressings, help her out, and it was, it was good. You know, a lot of guys really, um, <clears throat> pardon me, a lot of guys um, enjoyed working with her and uh, and helping out the family and we all kind of felt like yeah we're making a difference and then the problem was is it took up a lot of time it took up a lot of resources for us and it really lengthened the day for sick parade if guys were coming in and just people started kind of getting fed up with it They're like okay we've, we've done what we can now we need to see how uh, the local medical services or the local hospital is going to deal with this so some time went by so I'd Lack of a better, like lack for the time frame, let's give it maybe a month plus or minus um, that we were treating her. So at this point, we're like, hey, we've done what we can. We'd like you to, uh, to see how the local hospital is going to deal with this. And they're like, okay, sure, fine, no problem. A couple weeks or some, again, uh, the t some time had passed, and her dad, the father of this daughter, came back, and there's no daughter. So. I just always had kind of the misfortune. I've always had a, had a kind of the misfortune of like running into these some these kind of odd issues, where you have to make difficult decisions, and really the first decision was going to be well, oh well, let me. I'm getting ahead of myself. She had passed away. He came in to tell us like she had passed away, and that now he was looking for compensation for his time traveled, and bringing his daughter here, and then bringing her back home because this took up a lot of his time. So. I was initially met with shock, anger, frustration. I, I could have done very, something very silly to this individual with just kind of his response and the nonchalance of his, and she was a beautiful, beautiful daughter. Uh, you know, I could have taken this as a very Western kind of, kind of um, d or direction where it'd be like, how could you do this, you know, and be mad at them. But again, they did a great job with the whole cultural kind of aspect with us. And, you know, this is, his daughter, it's not a big deal, he's got other kids. This is how life goes here. And if, if, you, if you had problems with that or you didn't understand it, you'd drive down the street and you'd see the tiny little graves of all the, all the children and babies. Like, this is how it, this is how it goes. This is, this is a third world country. They don't have the same fortunes as we do and the same perspective. So I kind of took a breath and I'm like, all right, let's, let's see what we can do. So I go and get a translator, deal with, and try and kind of get all the facts. But I came to a very tough decision. This, is, this still bugs me to this day of going and telling Jamie, so Dr. Thibodeau, Captain Thibodeau at the time, going to tell Jamie that this happened or do I just deal with this and let everybody go on? Because Jamie, he's like, man, if I'm going to do something in this place, let's, let's try and save one person. Let's try and make something better for one person. If, if I can't save everybody, because that's what you want to do. You want to save everybody. You want to be a you want to be a hero, right? In some cases, I don't speak to everybody. Some people like they just want to carry on and do what they need to do. But let's let's try and do something. Let's try and change something. Um, and I was like, man, do I tell them, or do I just okay? Here's some chocolate. Here's some pop. Bye. Because that's what it turned out to be. But I was like, no, I better tell Jamie. So I went and told Jamie, and Jamie comes out and he's I'll just. I'll never forget the look on his face because he gets the whole story and he's like, okay. And he just looks at me and he's like, and I can't, I, I wish I could remember if he, if he said, JT deal with this or Sergeant Ferris or sorry, because they, they promoted me too. That's another thing, but I don't, that doesn't matter. They promoted me back and he's like, 
Sergeant Ferris, Ferris, can you just deal with this? But I can't remember what he said, and I wish I could. And he's, and I'm like, you know what? Got it, got it, sir. No problem. And like what I said, I gave him a box of chocolates, um, box of chocolates, pop. I don't know what else I gave him. Maybe some pens and paper. And I'm like, is this enough for compensation? And he's like, yeah, it's enough for compensation. Sure, I got it. done. Thank you. And he walked out, and I was just kind of, I kind of. Some things are resurfacing from that, you know, and that's that's tough. But that's the world. Like that's how the rest of the world sees it, and that's that's hard. And now being a father, I couldn't imagine that. But at the same time, it's different ideals, right? It's different circumstances. You have the ability to give them a better life, and for me, you know, I'll take that away, and I'll just say it's like that's how they live, that's how they perceive things. I can't change it. He was happy with a box of chocolate and and some pop, and you know, maybe he brought that back to his family, and they were able to celebrate and say, you know what, this is what we got. We got we got something out of this, and it was a positive, sure. Or they could have been like, hey, look what I got. I took these guys to the to the cleaners. I don't know, but it doesn't. It, I've moved on. And I've taken what I need from that to make me a better person, a more resilient person. But yeah, it's, it's one that bugs me quite a bit. And I'll be the first one to say it. I was one of the guys that advocated, hey, let's push her out to uh, the local the local hospital. While we still had uh, a lot of my peers that were like, hey, you know, let's let's keep this. Let's let's do this to the very end. And again, I was on the side that's like that in a lot of cases resulted in her dying. So it's a decision I made. It's a decision that we that we came to, and you know I'm smarter now, but uh, yeah, not too happy about it. But it, it's one of the things. One, the the two big incidences that kind of stick out for me, but one more so than the other. So, sorry, I went a little long. Go ahead, have a, have a drink. Um, but I do want to ask you for this one. So it's 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 a combination of the. The treatment and the compensation mm-hmm. that you're that you're bugged by. So. You know, it's just I should have known better, and I just should have had more patience for it. But at the same time, like, is that a resulting? Is that a result of just that 15 minutes sound bite that I was kind of? Well, I should. It's a poor expression. But that 15 minutes notice move that I'm on, um, that alpha male, like, no, nope, we've done what we can. It's their problem, right? Like, it's someone else's problem. Whereas it's like, no, we can, we, we can do this. It'll be longer days and we'll, uh, we'll have a tougher time with this. But like, let's, let's just see it through so that she's in a safer, and she was, like she was, in, she was in a good state. She was good. And again, she was at a level where the hospital could, could deal um, with her level of, of wound care and treatment. But um, whether it's compliance on the family, I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, too far for her to get there. And you know what, really, at the end of the day, the, the poor little gal, she's going to end up with a bad pneumonia or a bad infection, and they just weren't able to treat it as aggressively as we could have. So the exact same thing could have happened whether we kept her there the whole time. But at that, if, if we would have been continually monitoring her and, and kind of treating her, she might have had a better prognosis, maybe the same, but may, but at the same time, she could have had a better prognosis, maybe lived a little longer, who knows. So I think for me, it was just very few decisions I have in my life that I either regret or would like to change, very few, and that's probably the only one. Because with my motto, my work ethic now is uh, the right thing is always the hardest thing to do, and that's what I bring to work every single day. And again, it's not like this weighs on my shoulders, but it's just, it's, you know, this is what happens when either it's a case of complacency or, you know, you don't want to go that extra mile, and we could have. And this is some of the results that happen from it. You know, she could have very well lived in, or sorry, carried on living, or hell, she could have, um, you know, gotten through this treatment, been a young girl, and then all of a sudden get acid splash in her face or burnt by her parents or killed or ran over or some kind of terrible accident. So, you know, that's the other thing you have to kind of, you have to put in perspective as well too. So um, I think it was more the decision to say, I think we're okay here versus going that little extra mile. I think that's, that's what kind of bugs me with that to, to answer your question. Did you, uh, did you talk to the Dr. Thibodeau after the fact? 
I'm just kind of curious to know, I mean, he, he sort of asked you to deal with it, but subsequent to that, did you ever sit down with him and, and get his, like, a fuller reaction from him? I never... I'll answer that. I'll, I'll put that in kind of two parts. So pre or the, the pre ramble before we're like, or we're discussing her treatment plan, whether or not she's going to stay or go. That was and and uh, that that speech I had a little earlier, where it's like, let's try and do something. That was from Jamie. That was direct quote from Jamie. It's like, I'm going to do something and try and help her, and and do one good thing, one good deed out of this. So that was again the pre ramble, pre discussion, and again this. This was this was a, a group decision, and you know this wasn't something. It wasn't like my decision, but at the same time, Dr. Thibodeau was like, you know what? I think let's let's give it a shot, right? Like let's go from there. And I'm not quite sure uh, a lot of the details of, uh, of 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 you know whether he had certain things in place at the hospital, or uh, if it was even a discussion where hey, if things get worse, come back. I don't know. I'll never know. But afterwards kind of the, the discussion that we did have was we both could have done some physical harm to this individual. It would, nothing good would have come out of it, but we were both very, uh, very frustrated that you could, this is your daughter, this is, this is your blood, this is your child, and just so nonchalantly, you know, say, oh, she passed away. But again, that's where I reverted back to it's a cultural thing. That's just, that's just how it was. And that's how it is in a lot of third world countries. And again, you even see it here in in uh, in the Western world as well too. Just people um, don't take take their children for granted, or maybe uh, you know don't care for them as well as as other people, or don't even have the financial backing or support that they need for their kids. But it happens everywhere, and and that was just kind of our our. our little discussion there. And it was it was just quiet. It was very short. It was just both we both were like that was that was terrible. It's like, yeah. It's like I'm just glad he's gone cuz yeah, I think I think uh, Dr. Thibodeau did a lot of um like karate and combat stuff and he was just like I could have I just something bad could have happened if that would have lasted any longer, but he just he couldn't couldn't deal with it, couldn't process process it just his emotions were pretty high when he got the news. So and again, that's that's the other thing is, you know, maybe I just should have swept it underneath and just saved him that that kind of that turmoil. But for me, that's not my that's not my. It rever I came back to that's not that's not right. People need to know the truth. So, but yeah, that that's that was kind of the pre post stam or ramble afterwards. And then we some people were a little busted up that night because Doctor Tabolo came in and informed everybody. And again, it was very it was very it was very. Um, it was, it was just very professional. It's just like she didn't make it. And we didn't tell them about like the father and the compensation stuff, but we just stuck to the facts. So it was, it was tough. When you, uh, when you finally get a chance to take a break, mm -hmm. to go on leave, uh, where did you go and what was that like? Uh, it was Christmas. So they actually split us up, uh, the crew. I'm not sure... I think in a lot of cases it was just so they didn't have to roll in an entire new bison, and they didn't want us to to really break up the the crew that we had with the uh, with uh, the EOD guys and VP. So uh, my driver and myself both went at separate times, um, and I just went back home to Edmonton. And from Edmonton, uh, Vanessa and I went to Cuba, uh, which was awesome. Got some rum, got some scars, uh, spent some late nights kind of talking, got a couple hours of sleep, but. Uh, Again, like it, I, it was just, I was just happy to be there. And I think from living so much in the present um, during my time in Afghanistan and just being there, being ready for that moment, being prepared for that moment, I came back and I was just, I was just there for her. It was just us. It was nice. It was great. It was, it was a good time. It was a good break. But on the 30th of December um, was the, the big incident where we, I th uh, uh, it was the embedded reporter, and I think we lost uh, uh, at least five guys. Anyway, you know that was the big incident. So I, I remember it because I came into the living room, turned on the TV, and it was like, you know, uh, we had all, or sorry, we had all these people killed in Afghanistan. And I'm looking at the screen, and I'm looking at Vanessa, and I shouldn't have said anything, but I was like, those are I'm like, where was that bomb? That those are our guys. Like that was that was our group of guys that got hit. And this was right, like, I think it was like 48 hours before I had to hop on a plane and go back. 
And that's where all of a sudden it really kind of hit us. Like this vacation was over now and the reality of, of what's going on and what's happening really set in. So uh, for me, and I was fortunate enough, you know, and some people look at it different ways, but a lot of my peers and the guys that actually were on um, responding to that call all said, it's like, you didn't need to be here, man. You don't need to see this and that's okay. Because uh, I felt a little guilty for missing that and not being there um, to help. But we had fantastic people that are trained and ready to go and, and do the job that they need to do. And they took care of it. They took care of it very well. And uh, the, med the medic that was on ground did an awesome job. Uh, she did a fantastic job triaging and getting people out of there and either saving life and limbs. She did an amazing job. And uh, the relief crew that was in there did a fantastic job as well too. The guy that was... Uh, um, that was taken over as the crew commander, hopped out, helped, did an awesome job. It was a long day for those guys, and I kind of came in afterwards, and it was just a, a bit of a fresh face. So like, KJT, it's really nice to have you back. Got hugs, pats on the back, high fives, and it was like, you know what? It's nice to have you here, and it's refreshing to have you here, especially after what had happened. So that was my odd kind of HLTA. It was just this really nice vacation, and then it was just this really kind of snap back into okay it's 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 game on it's time to go back hit with a terrible incident got to go back see how guys are doing you know try and uh, do my job and again try and help out morale the best i can because it was it was it wasn't crippled like we a very resilient group of people we were with and excellent uh excellent people we were with and you know they were able to work through it and make thing make sure that uh, mental health was access to them you were able to talk and, and just open with the discuss or sorry open with what what uh, what people were feeling. But again, some people might have um, further problems from that incident. But for me, it was just I wasn't there, so I didn't have to have that. Uh, I didn't I didn't have to go through that. And, you know, some people had like what I said. Some people had some worse, some 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 bad experiences. Some people just missed it on HLTA. So it was tragic. It was bad. Um, and, uh, you know, whether I'm so like, I don't mean to be selfish, but it's like, I, I don't think I would have done anything different if I was there. Like, I can't, I don't blame myself for not being there. Um, I wouldn't have done anything different. I would have been in the truck. I would have gone out and responded and helped and triaged and dra dragged people out of vehicles and put them on helicopters and try and clean up and help out everyone, right? That's, I would have done the same, whether it would have been better or worse than the people were, that were there. So... That's the way you have to look at it. And no, I don't harbor any bad feelings or ill feelings towards it. It's just, it was tough because that's, that was the reality check for my, uh, for Vanessa and, and myself. It's like, yeah, we're going back to war zone. Bad stuff happens. But uh, yeah, that was, it. that was kind of the HLTA though. That was kind of my experience. It was odd, but it was good. Cuba was nice. What about when you're, uh, <clears throat> what are your feelings when you're finally leaving Afghanistan? And you're heading off to Cyprus, I assume. Do you remember like, your emotional state? That's just, fun. just actually relief. It's you want to be there, and you want to keep going. And you know, you you ha for for me, it was like you know, you feel like things aren't done. Well, and here's the other thing. So uh, after the thirtieth, the C, uh, the UOD guys um, got all the information regarding that specific cell. They were like, we're gonna go in. We're gonna deal with this. And they had a pretty comprehensive plan on actually raiding these guys, getting everything, and 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 uh, you know whether you want to look at it, revenge, a revenge story, vengeance, or um, retaliation. Like they were ready to go. So the problem was I was leaving, and my driver and I were split on three days as, as well with uh, ripping out and ripping in. So it's like it was a it was a case of um, being a little incomplete, you know, closing that loop. But then I kind of thought about it. It's like, well, I wasn't there for the incident, and I'm not there for the big hurrah. So it's a kind of an interesting way to kind of segue in and out of this this whole event, this whole ordeal. But I, I had a sense of relief, and then I actually had a little bit of pride too because uh, the new crew came in. So the, the, the new crew came in, but my driver and I were on split times coming out, like about three days. And the new crew, the new crew is the new crew, and we'll leave it at that. They did things differently, but I was missed. So, but I uh, left on my birthday, 
April 27th, never forget that, that was nice. Got out of Afghanistan, couldn't have had a better birthday present ever. And uh, I was just happy it was all over. It was like, I made it, I'm done. I'm, uh, I'm a better person for it. I was in great shape. Um, I got to see the sea, I got to see the, the Canadian forces um, operate at, I would say, like the, uh, like, not, not like a CSO or special ops kind of level, like where it's very uh, specialized and, and everything is smooth or as smooth as it can be. Again, I don't know how those guys operate. I'm pretty sure they, they have their frustrations and issues. But where we were at, we had a, a great team. We were a specialized team. Uh, we had a, a, like a spe like a specific job that we had to do. And I felt that, you know, there were some issues and there were some things that weren't complete. But every day we went out, took bombs apart, came home, and everything just operated very smoothly. So I just, I kind of looked back on it and I was like, you know what, we did a good job. I was happy with, with working at that specific level and uh, very fortunate to have worked with the, the amazing people that I had worked with. And I felt, I felt like I was done. I felt like I did what I could. I'm good. Got no regrets. I'm out. That's really what it was. Pretty satisfied? I would, that would probably be the best way to put it. Satisfied, very satisfied. And Cyprus was interesting. Can I get a pop? And the guy looked at me, he's like, so I'll get you a pop. So he gets me a little pop. He's like, that's like, I don't know, seven euros or whatever. And then he's like, I'll get you a beer. And he's like, let's just get you a beer. So he gets me a beer. Beer's at least three times the size of it. He's like, that's two euros. What do you want to do, buddy? And I'm like, well, do I still need to pay for the pop? just takes the pop away and I'm like okay and that was Cyprus and it was awesome it was good nothing too crazy happened there but uh yeah I can see why they do that you know if I came right off the boat and came home and and uh put Vanessa through through uh through that that first night oh my goodness oh my goodness probably would have sent me to the hospital but silly young Trying to be, uh, you know, now you have all this freedom and you're just going to go live in the moment. I remember we ran out to the ocean, uh, just kind of remembered how beautiful the world is and, and uh, what to look forward to and why you go and do this. And you were like, yeah, you know what? This is why we do what we do. This is why we make these sacrifices is so that we can make this, make this, like, Make the world a better place, make it secure, make it safe, so that you don't have to be scared. You can see how wonderful the world is for what it is, and then you're not going to have some at, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to have some figurehead or some, um, some, some dictator come in and take that away from you and just destabilize everything so that everyone's living in poverty and live, everyone's living in mud huts. And living in fear or well whether it's fear or whatever they're living in or making it from day to day but you know you can have kids they can walk around the street not get shot at blown up or they can wear whatever the heck they want to wear and live the way they want to live you know that that was the thing especially when you got to the ocean you saw everything and reinforce when i came here and i got to sort of see how beautiful canada is and just remember how beautiful this country how big this country is and I don't mean to get corny, but that's what it was. Like I just remember even going through BC and just looking at the mountains and the trees, and it's just like, yeah, yeah, I would, I would die for this. No, no questions asked. I'd go back. You got it. So that was kind of, again, I kind of expanded a little bit further into into coming back, but that's that's what it was. It was just this great feeling of man, I did something really awesome. I'll never have that experience again. Uh, never work with those people again, but. Made me a better person, maybe a better, maybe a better citizen, and just really appreciate what we have here. Again, as corny as you know, as corny as that sounds, that's what I really took away from it. What was it like? And then when you put that behind you, yeah. you've come back home, and now you're trying to re-civilianize yourself to go from that focus, living in the moment, yeah. as you describe it, and now it's you know it's a big 180. Tough. It was tough. So initially I came back. I was one of the very few reserves that was actually to uh, secure a Class B contract. It was when we were in theater, uh, I think we were about two, three months out where the tour was kind of ending. They're like, boom, over. Class B is done. Finito. We are canceling everything. Don't expect to have a Class B when you come back. So 
thank goodness, I was able to secure Class B doing the TCCC coordination for a little bit for, um, pardon me, the next task group going out. Did that for a couple months. I was able to go back to uh, Shiloh and teach a couple t uh, courses and actually meet up with uh, a couple of the VP guys there and have a little closure. So that was nice. Like I got a little taste of like, if I was in the reg force and doing this full time, like this is how you're kind of treated when you come back. You come back, you have a lot of support, you have your peers, you have your support group. And I can see how guys can get through this and then like, you know, reintegrate and kind of come back. And But you're still like, this is hard army, hard army. That's what they do. This is the full-time guys. And then for me, class B was done. Everything was cut, no support, no nothing. And I couldn't get a job, could not get a job. Afghanistan veteran, no one was interested, no one cared. Um, had crazy awesome medical experience, crazy awesome uh, trauma, or trauma uh, training, nobody cared. No one uh, either cared or wanted me. And that again, that's just, that's the way it goes, right? Them's, them's the breaks. It's like, okay, sure, you're back. You know, there's a lot of people ahead of you that are still trying to get these positions. And to be, uh, sorry, just to kind of be specific, I was trying to get hired as, uh, as an EMT at the time in the province. And they're like, a lot of people, a lot of people ahead of you, man, that got a lot of experience. And, you know, it's nice that you have this and thank you for your service, but we're just not overly interested. So continue to apply, try to get work, try to get work. And then I was very fortunate that uh, I went out to Camrose, did an interview there, kind of gave him my spiel, gave him my talk. And then two hours later, I had the job and full circle. It was because Dr. Thibodeau was one of my references. And he basically said, it's like, if you don't hire this guy, you are at a detriment because he is one of one of the best practitioners that I know. He walks on water, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't privy to that conversation. It would have been nice to, to have known exactly what he said. But uh, Mr. Postma, the guy that uh, hired me out in Camrose, picked up the phone and said, so Jamie Timido, I think you should buy him either some beers or coffees because he basically said like, I should hire you. That was how it went. So I, I was fortunate. I got a job, um, and I got. I went back to employment that was very similar to Afghanistan. You're basically on 15 minutes notice to move, or is uh, five minutes minutes, minutes notice to move during that 12-hour shift, and uh, working as an EMT uh, in the pre-hospital setting because you get a call, you got to go right. So it it fit real well um, from my experience there to coming back and coming on the road and working in, and working for uh, uh, for the province, which was great. So that I was very fortunate, very fortunate, because a lot of my peers that were on the same tour couldn't find work. You know, you're either going out, and luckily enough, they were able to go out to the oil patch, get some employment there, but uh, it was pretty slim pickings. And you, again, the it's nice when you can come back and, and don't get me wrong. Like I had a lot of offers, a lot of, a lot of people were like, Hey, you should probably join the reg force, you know, like we'll sign the paper. It's all good. We got, you got a job. Like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Like the opportunity was there. It's just, I, whether it was a case of pride, stupidity, or, you know, again, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's like, yeah, maybe I should have. Cause I'd be a little bit closer towards a pension. Have a, and again, have that support when I uh, when I get uh, when I come back, have employment, um, and again, you know whatever they're going to do with me when I get in uh, and wherever you're going to go, you have to roll with that. But didn't have uh, have kids at that time. Vanessa was more would be would have been probably more than happy to move or or accommodate that. But you know, like what I said, hindsight's twenty twenty, and the opportunity and they did like the opportunity was mentioned a number of times. Like hey, you should just switch over, right? So. You know that's that's kind of the, the that's the the way I looked at it. It's like you know they're it, it's not uh, it's it's my fault. Like that's the thing is you have to take ownership. That's the thing you have like you have pe you have people that complain all the time. It's like when I didn't get this or when I didn't get that, and that's fine. You you are entitled to that opinion. Go right ahead. But at the same time, you have to take ownership of hey, you know what? I don't have a job. Maybe I should go to this employer that sent me to Afghanistan, trained me, took care of me, you know, to extents. Everybody has issues with, with, with that. But the opportunity's there and you can go and do that. Or 
you can try and work in the oil patch. You can go back to doing your class A thing. You know, you can try and go work at McDonald's. You can go scrub toilets. Like you can do what you need to do, but you have to kind of take ownership of it. And I, my wife kind of says it sometimes too. It's like, you know, like they had support, you didn't, and you had to do, you know, you had to go drive two extra hours to, uh, or it ended up being an extra four hours round trip from Camrose and back to do your, to do, um, to do the job that I wanted to do. Um, whereas a lot of the reg force guys were, well, I'm already got a job. I'm good. I'm on each, I'm on, I'm on leave for a bit here. I got some time to decompress, be with my family, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, you know, she kind of mentions, mentions that or says, Hey, that's, you know, that's, that's not right. And it's like, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm a reservist. Like I, I kind of, we all, we all saw this coming. Like this isn't a big surprise. So what are you going to do with it? You're going to sit and complain and, and, and not try and fix the situation or are you going to step up and be a soldier, you know, and don't get me wrong, I am a reservist, but are you going to do what you're supposed to do, get a job, work, and carry on, right? So that, that's a little tough. That might be a little tough for some people to swallow, but to be completely honest, that's, that's how I felt. And again, I was very fortunate. I got a job. Um, I went back to school I, and I became a paramedic. I got a job as a paramedic and I'm still gamefully employed, you know, and I, I had some issues with the reserves, you know, it, it's tough to go back to, it's tough to go back to the mundane class A life where it's like, okay guys, IBTS, shoot the C7, I don't care about all the cool, like I don't care about the stuff that you did in Afghanistan, that's not relevant here, you guys need to go set up modular tent to make sure trucks run, and again, you can't get trucks that'll run properly, you can't get equipment that'll run properly, you're always the second thought, and then, you know, things happen, i.e. the floods. Hey, guys, we need you to go out and deploy and do things. Or, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the, the other things that I'm concerned about, but the world is a dynamic place. And at the end of the day, the reserves, the one thing that's, that's good with us, and here's me on my soapbox, is, you know, we're very versatile. We're, we have a lot of mobility. Uh, in some cases, we, not, we might not get the numbers that we need right then and there. But if all of a sudden you need somebody to either step up, do something, or you know, hey, I need you to go step. I need I need you to go set up a truck over here, or I need you to set up a UMS there. Like we can scramble together and put some kind of infrastructure there until we can get additional support or additional infrastructure. So, with all that being said, that was I kind of touched a little bit about how I came back and how things worked out, and then just some difficulty with actually integrating back into the just the class A thing, but. It was tough, but the lessons I learned from Afghanistan and the lessons I learned from my previous experience in this TF is take some ownership. You're going to have, and that was the other thing too, is like, you're going to have problems. Yeah. Like you're going to have nightmares. You're might all of a sudden have a couple extra drinks once in a while, just cause like you need to kind of calm down. That's not, that's okay to an extent, but like if you're having issues, go talk to somebody. And I did. I was fortunate enough. I was able to talk to some mental, uh, the 1-800 number there. You call the base uh, orderly room there. Or sorry, the ba or you call, you dial zero and they'll give you the number. Contacted them. I had, to this day, I think I've had three discussions with them with like a psychiatrist. And you know what the nice thing to hear was? Yeah, you're normal. It's okay. Like you went to a war zone for seven months we're up here the entire time. What do you think is going to happen when you come back and you're trying to integrate and everything's safe and you're not going to be, you know, the, the biggest threat you might have is maybe getting hit by a car or getting in a car accident, but no one's going to shoot you. There's going to be no bombs. You don't have to be on high readiness. Like you're going to fluctuate and it's going to take time to feel normal again. And for me, I would say I'm starting to kind of feel normal and it's taken a long time. Didn't have to do medication or anything like that, you know had a good support group, but it was just nice to hear that you're normal, this is okay, and I think you'll be fine. But if things get worse, call us. It's like, okay. And to go back and just kind of reiterate the whole, like that whole um, reserve reg force kind of thing is, and the opportunity was there, is that's why it's nice when you have that peer group you can go back to and you can have guys say, it's okay, man, like it's all right. And I got a little taste of that when, when I went to Shiloh and I had some senior people say, it's like, it's okay. You're going to be all right. It's just going to take time. If you need help, ask for it. And like what people were saying, things are better, but it's not a perfect system. Yes, there's a lot of stigma, but if you're having issues and you're really having problems, like, you know, you know, you know, help to anybody. So get the help you need. 
and just try to, again, try and break down those walls, try and break through those stigmas of mental health or, or really having issues. But when you put it in perspective, the things that we did and what you were expected to do, yeah, people are going to have problems. Get the help you need. I'm just going to pause one more time. Sure. Um, I'd like to get your take on the Army as an employer, mm -hmm. of the Class B reservists. Mm -hmm. um, we, we made a big deal about the CFLC, you know, that we're going to help you, we're going to protect your civilian job, we're going to make sure you get a job to come back to. Mm -hmm. And yet, how did the Army, in your opinion, how well did the Army treat the full time reservists that uh, basically helped it uh, win this? Well, basically helped to fight this war. Mm -hmm. You know, the Class Bs that had to give up their Class Bs and then came back like you did, and there's no job. Is that a sore spot? It's a cause of doing business. You know, like we had, I think it's all in the delivery, I feel sometimes. And uh, with the military, uh, it's, it's pretty much a, a black and white, hard yes or no, and you have to kind of respond to that. The, the delivery was, too bad, so sad, like no more class Bs, that's it, so, sorry. Well, actually, I don't think we got a sorry. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's how it goes, like that's how class Bs operate and that's how this works in, a feder in, the, in this federal organization. I think in a lot of cases, maybe intern leadership or the leadership that was initially on site that kind of got that, you know, when you're dealing with a lot of reg force guys that are like, okay, yeah, you got no class B, bye. Um, I think if there would have been maybe a little bit more uh, support where it's like, okay, you know what, let's get you letters of reference. Let's, let's get you, uh, like, you know, let's get you online and maybe you should start looking at getting, at getting jobs, right? And that's what I did with my guys. I'm like, guys, like, like get your resumes out, get them brushed up, start making phone calls, start applying now. And, and like, this is what you need to do. You need to have a plan. Like, and that's the one thing that the military trained me to do. It's you have plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You, can go, you, got the whole, you got the whole alphabet you can go through for plans, right? So I think maybe it might've been a little bit of uh, the, dyna the dynamic in theater. And you're still very, you know, still very much in the red. You're still running hot every day and you have a lot of emotional responses. I think initially it was a lot of hurt feelings, an emotional response uh, versus kind of like, okay, let's, let's actually think about this, guys. Like, okay, they are telling us there's no employment. It's over. Let's start planning for this. Like, you can go back. You can do some Class A stuff initially. Let's start looking. And like what I said, resumes, letters, plan for it. So for me, yeah, there was a lot of hurt feelings to, to really answer the question. There was a lot of hurt feelings. I was initially pretty frustrated right off the bat, but I had that mental fortitude and that resiliency and also realizing, hey, this is like a part-time gig, guys, and this is, there's, there's no guarantee that we're going to have employment, so let's start making decisions and let's start planning, right? And people kind of turned around and, you know, uh, sorry, people turned around and they started making those plans, making those adjustments and saying, hey, I need to get some work. Other people were fortunate enough that like either maybe a class B or two did kick up or they were in a pretty hard set kind of kind of role. So that was OK. They were fortunate to run into that. But again, other people, they just continue to be, well, lack of a better word, like miserable and just kind of blame and, and like, you know, blame and and kind of complain about the situation they're in versus trying to change it. And yeah. Like what I said, to answer your question, yeah, there were some definite hurt feelings, but at, at the same time, like, you have to kind of plan for those, uh, uh, for those situations. So I did okay. I'm not, I, don't, I got no hurt feelings over it, and I came out all right. I really did. But over and above the, the Army's policy, right? Mm -hmm. you know, okay, like, we're going to scale back class Bs. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming in your case, because you said you were on a number of class Bs before yep. they over. Yep. You had to basically break that contract. You, you knew going overseas, I am not going back to that class B. Like I had to, in, in essence, you had to leave your job mm -hmm. to go overseas. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, do you think that's, that's the way that reservists in those positions should have been treated? Uh, to clarify, um, a lot of people were going over with uh, the information that you would still have this class B when you came back. And I think that's where people got pretty, 
pretty pissed off. Um, that was even the same kind of intention with me. It's like, yep, you'll come back. We got money, right? Because that hey, at that time, like the money money train was, oh man, I I don't even want to talk about the like just money. Like there was like, no there was no problem with money. You needed something, you got it. You need someone flown across the country to come teach, not a problem. Like that was not that was never the issue. But when it rains, it pours. But all of a sudden, like when there's a drought, there's a drought, right? And we need, and, and I'll be the same one. I'll be the first one to say it. Like you need to be financially responsible for, for, for things that are going on. And, and there was like a lot of money that was being thrown at us. So um, I think that was, to again, to clarify, I think some people had the intention or they were like, yep, we're still going to be good when we come back. So I think that's where a lot of animosity and, and hurt and, and hurt feelings came from. Whereas, yeah, there's no more money. Like, it's over. Like, it, everything's, like, the tap is turned off. You're done. So I think that's where there was, um, there was so much frustration initially. And there wasn't really that clarity. And from me now, I just got, I'm a little bit better educated, a little wiser now. And that's where when people are hopping from class B to class B and we have these junior guys in the reserves, that's where us, and especially with the experience that we bring, we have to say, guys, either save for a rainy day or don't expect this forever and train your people to be resilient. You know, so that's where, and it's, and that's the other thing too, it's happened before. Like this, this is all, like history tends to repeat itself. So I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not really, I, I just I always kind of, I, I am a little surprised that people were as angry, and I was as angry too. I'll be the first one to say it, but should have kind of should have seen it coming. So hopefully that answers that. Just in, in, to summarize, how do you think uh, this experience uh, changed, uh, affected you as a person and as a soldier? When you look back at it, it gave me an experience that very few people will have, and it's made me incredibly. Just, just, a, just, I just appreciate what we have, and what I have, and the opportunities that I've been afforded, and at the same time, it's made me realize some of the opportunities that I've squandered, and maybe not taken taken advantage of, just because it gave me a, a global view of how things go, and maybe, and again, things things are always changed, and things kind of get twist, or sorry, things get turned. But you, you kind of understand now like how these situations are really fought. And in a lot of cases, it's not really fought on the ground. Like it's fought through a media outlet, uh, the way you spin things, opinion. And it's, it's more of a, of a mental perception of things than anything else. Like that's what I really kind of took away from that. It's like it's all about perception. And like... You know, I, I was there and people were still kind of discussing the whole oil thing and and uh, discussing reasons that we were there. And at the end of the day, I was like, I was like, we were there just trying to support these people. That's really what it was and do some other cool stuff. But like we were there to support these people and try and provide infrastructure for them. So it kind of gave me a better perception of like what's what's real. And if you want to see what's going on, you need to be there and you need to kind of experience it. Um, so that's one thing I took away uh, from that. Um, personally, is if you're gonna see it and do it, you gotta you gotta be there. You really have to get a feel for it. As a soldier, um, resiliency. It, it, it's I, I don't think I've ever had after that experience just a better a better perception of what we can be as an organization. What the Canadian Armed Forces, when we all come together, have a goal in mind. And are functioning at a very, a very elite, professional, well-structured uh, organization like what we can accomplish, and it's it's mind it's it it blows my mind, you know, to think that what were we at for best capacity over there like twenty five hundred, like maybe three thousand roughly, and the AO we had and the equipment that we had and what guys were expected to do and what we were able to to accomplish. It's, it's truly mind-boggling. And then to see and to be there when history was changing and history was happening, when 10,000 U.S. troops showed up to do the same job that we have, basically um, four times the amount of people to do what we were doing, and probably more, 
uh, it just, it was like, it was an incredibly humbling experience. And you could even see it. They're like, wow, you guys like held this ground. Like you guys were able to do this with this many people. It's like, yeah, that's what we did. So to summarize, it'd probably be a lot of pride in this organization, what we can do. And when we're at our best, we are truly at our best. What about at the, uh, I'm just curious, and I, I, it's funny, I, I asked very few people this question, but I mean at the, at the strategic level, mm -hmm. or when you look at this country today, mm -hmm. do you think it was all, was it worth it? What, what, what are we accomplish in the bigger picture? You know, it ain't Vimy. It ain't something where we're, we're putting, um, you know, we're, we're trying to establish kind of like a national identity. It's nothing to that extent. Um, was it a case of trial and error? Like, you know, I, I, I really look back at it and I'm like, you know, were, were we just trying to see what we were capable of at that time? Like, was it, just a, was it just a run through? Was it just a trial? Was it just, you know, we just want to see what we're actually capable of and kind of test our mettle? Uh, was that kind of was that kind of the point of it? Was that what we were trying to do? Again, like at a strategic, where you kind of you're looking at it on the outside, but you know, were we just there to try and provide support or do any kind of interruption between uh, Pakistan and Iraq and trying to stabilize any kind of lines of um, or sorry, any kind of lines uh, through um, through that area? Like I don't know. Like I I really don't know. But was it worth it? It was worth it for me. Whether it was worth it for the CF or the CFA or whatever we're going to be called in the next couple of years, um, as an organization as a whole, that's for someone else to discuss. That's for historians to discuss. That's for um, the people that we went there and represented and our future to discuss. For me, I can honestly say it was worth it for me to have gone and to have done my job. Is there anything <clears throat> that I haven't asked you that you want to say in sort of sort of final thoughts? No, I think I put it all out there. I just I just want to everybody has everybody has had a different experience with it. I might come across a sunshine lollipops maybe with mine that I, I, I took away what I could out of it. I had a good experience. Um, but that was my experience. That's what I did. Maybe I got some facts kind of a little skewed with obviously some numbers and some timelines. Um, you know, that's for corrections later. But for me, in my experience, the people that I worked with, I'm just, I was happy that they were there and I was happy that everything worked out the way it did. And, um, Again, just just that I am better for it. And I hope, like what I said, I hope our peers, I hope historians, I hope people that will either look at this and study this, this very interesting part, in, part of history will find that there was some, something positive that came out of it and not really look at it for, you know, whether it was a political move or whether it was just, you know, is this just some kind of trial to see what we can do as an organization and, and push our people. And we pushed our people hard, like really hard. And, and, and that's kind of the fallout afterwards. But as long as we can take everything that was positive from that, or you know what, not even positive. If we can take that entire experience, whether it's good, bad, whatever, and make it and make it better for future troops, for future leaders, and, and give depth, and which we have in this organization, which we have as soldiers and non-commissioned officers. If we can really give them that depth of understanding of loss, dealing with dif difficult tactical situations, dealing with you know, complex cultural situations as well too, as long as we can get something out of it, and again, make us better for it, that's really all. That's really about it. That's all I want to say. I just want, I want to ask 
you one more question though. They, uh, did you ever read Graham Smith's book? The one about the, the dogs are reading them now. The do you know what? I, I have it on my Kobo. And I was just, I, I've just got through the prologue. I'm just kind of getting into it. Um, but I have, I have not given it the enough time that, uh, that it deserves, but it is on my reading list. His very first sentence, and this is not verbatim, mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, we lost the war in southern Afghanistan, and it broke my heart. What do you think of that statement? Does that resonate with you at all? Very much so. Very much so. I'd be hard-pressed that I could go back to Kabul right now, and it would be a booming metropolis. I would be very hard-pressed. Has it regressed? I don't know. I haven't, I, I'll be the first one to say it. I haven't really kept up on um, the stabilization of, uh, or how things have kind of moved forward with Afghanistan. I kind of, um, with the flow of knowledge, I, I, I'd catch what's basically up in the CBC or any kind of regular postings. And most of it's either bombs or people got killed or, you know, it doesn't really seem to be in a positive direction where, um, the stabilization that we tried to provide, that the, the communities and the tribes and everybody there took advantage of it. Um, but yeah, that's very well said, is that, you know, and again, again, like what I said, like what I was mentioning earlier is like the measure of loss, the measure of success, like what are we truly measuring this by, right? Is it a case of, that's gonna be destabilized, it's a bad area, like it's a very, very bad area. You know, you need people to, um, uh, move shipments across and get things across that border and get it up into uh, 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 up into the areas that, that it's or sorry that those materials are required um, and again that's for another conversation for people of a higher pay grade than me in education but um, is it a case that and for me the way I have to look at it is did we maybe give you know what this is the way I look at it I had us I, I, I was here I did a call we were out in the West End and I ran into a guy at a, at, a, at a subway, and I don't know how it came up, but he was from Kabul. He came from Kabul, he came here. And there he is making a sandwich, happy, and he's like, I got out of there, and I can't remember if I mentioned that like I was in the CF or whatever, but he was just like, he was just thankful. He's like, thank you. Thank you for giving us a glimpse, or thank you for getting us out of there, or providing some means for us to get out and try and live our lives and 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 just get out of that situation so is that a, is it, you know the entire stabilization of the area or or how things are progressed like is that the measure of success or is it the fact that we were able to give these people an opportunity to get out of there and to come here and you know that segues into further enormous issues enormous issues and I'm dealing with, and again, not so that much that I'm dealing with them, but I see them kind of progressing uh, in our in, in the community, and especially in the Edmonton area and in Canada. You know, there's lots of things that are happening, and there's lots of issues that that arise, and there's always security issues, and you know, is this going to come here? But whether it does or doesn't, we've given hope to people that were completely hopeless or didn't even realize that there's something outside of Afghanistan. So. That's kind of the way I look at it. That was excellent. Thank you. No problem.